Hello. So this video um, is something I watched for my class called Child Full of Rage. Um, it's highly interesting. So if you haven't seen it, then you're in for, you know, a treat, especially if mental health and is interesting to you. So thank you for watching. Who's afraid of you, Beth? John. Your brother. And what is your brother? Why is your brother afraid of you? Because I hurt him so much. Mm-hmm. Okay. And what, at nighttime, what do your parents do to your door? Lock it shut. Mm, why do they lock it shut? Because they don't want me to hurt John. Right, and they're kind of afraid of of hurting John. Are you hurting John? Mm -hmm. Okay. Are they afraid that you might hurt them? Yep. Would you, Beth? Mm-hmm. When would you do it? Nighttime. Okay. Why would you do nighttime? Because I don't like them seeing me go up, but they can go me go up. Mm-hmm. And what would you do to him, Beth? Stab him. Okay. What would you stab him with? A knife. The program you are about to see was compiled from the actual therapy tapes of Dr. Ken McGid, a clinical psychologist specializing in the treatment of severely abused children, children so traumatized in the first years of life that they do not bond with other people. They are children who cannot love or accept love. Children without conscience who can hurt or even kill without remorse. This film shows the devastating effects of abuse on a child. It also shows that victims can be helped. It is the story of a six and a half year old girl named Beth. Do you ever stick pins in people? Yeah. Do you do it a little bit or a lot? A lot. Okay. And what are you trying to do to your brother? Kill him. Why do you want your brother to die? Because I was hurt so bad and I don't want to be around people. Okay. Who else would you like to stick pins into? Mommy and Daddy. What would you like to have happen to them? Da. Jesus couldn't have lived to save Israel. He chose to die to save the world. Tim is the minister of a small Methodist church in the South. He and his wife Julie have been married for 12 years. Unable to have children of their own, they decided to adopt. In February of 1984, they received a call from the Department of Social Services telling them they had two children available for adoption. They were told that Beth, 19 months old, and her brother Jonathan, 7 months old, were normal and healthy. We did not need children to make our lives complete. We felt secure in ourselves and secure in our relationship, but we wanted to share that with somebody else, and we felt like we had a lot to pass on to a child, and that was what we really wanted to do. And when the phone call came, it was like, at last it's here. And it seemed like a miracle. It happened so quick. We'd heard of couples having to wait five, ten years on, on a child, and here we had two young children. Um, it was like the answer to our dream. Their dream became a nightmare when they realized that Beth and Jonathan had severe emotional problems. We had the kids with us. Uh, Beth and her younger brother John for uh, probably a couple of months until we began to learn something about their background and their past. And when we learned it, uh, something seemed to fall in place about her behavior and John's behavior. 
uh, from several sources, we discovered that uh, that they didn't have enough food to eat. Uh, that perhaps even Beth went all day, maybe with just a box of kick cereal. John himself was found in a, a bassinet with uh, little patches of urine all over it, and a dirty diaper, and a couple of bottles at his feet that had curdled milk, and the back of his head was completely flat. Uh, the front of his head had bulged out, and he, at uh, seven months he couldn't raise his head, couldn't roll over. Uh, he was uh, just had had no stimulation, and uh, <clears throat> we think perhaps that had happened to Beth, and it wasn't very long until uh, she began showing some signs of perhaps uh, even some abuse. Uh, there was a nightmare uh, that she had, and the nightmare was about uh, a man who was falling on her and uh, hurting her with a part of himself. Tell me about your birth father. What was that nightmare like? When he touched my vagina. Okay. And so it bled. Hurt a lot. And so it bled. And, um,. Let me be me a lot. He turned on me. Wanna be very nice to me. How old are you? One. And in your nightmare, what happens? I get lost care. Where are you in the nightmare? What happens in the dream? I'm in the house, upstairs. And then what happens then? When he comes upstairs and, um, hurts. How do you feel when you talk about this? Scared. Where's your birth, where's your birth father? What's he doing? He's right there, and there's his hand. His hand's right there. Where? Right there. You can't hardly see it because it's green. What's it touching? My vaginas. And what is your birth father doing? Heart nut. Your face looks uh, sad. Can you tell me about that? Mm-hmm. It's crying because there's lots of the tears. Beth had endured severe neglect and abuse as a child. Her birth mother died when she was one. Because of these early childhood experiences, Beth never developed a sense of conscience, love, or trust for anyone. The early sexual abuse by her birth father would cause her to exhibit inappropriate sexual behavior, especially toward her brother. Does your brother have private parts? Um. Yeah. Yeah? What, are the, what is his private parts? Penis and butt. Mm -hmm. And what do you do with your brother with his private parts, Ben? I hurt it. Tell me about it. What do you do? Now, I pinch it, um, squeeze it, um, kick it. When you do things to your brother's private parts, what does he say? Stop. Okay, tell me that. Well, he says stop, but I don't stop. Do you hurt him? Mm-hmm. A lot. Okay. And would you like to do that to other boys? <laughs> when I caught her with Jonathan one morning, she was molesting him. Um, he was crying and his pants were down, and I said, Beth, what's happening? And she said, I pulled his penis and put my finger up his anus. And uh, I said, didn't he say to stop? And she said, yeah, I did. And I said, did you? And she said, no. Have you ever rubbed your private parts? Mm hmm Do you do it a lot? A lot. How much do you do that? About every single day, and that's it. I did it every single day until it got all bad and I stopped and I had to get to the doctor and I did not like it. What, what do you mean by real bad? Well, it looked 
several raw dental kinds of boo-boos on it, germs, mm -hmm. raw stuff from the hand. And it bled? Mm-hmm. She started to masturbate at inappropriate times. Um, I remember one time, typically, when we were at the hospital waiting for Tim to come out, he was there visiting. And Beth and John were in the back seat, and I turned around, and, and she had her legs spread and was masturbating in a public parking lot. And I had tried to explain to her new, numerous times before that, that that's a private area. You don't do it in public places. And um, gone over that with her, and, and it never seemed to face her. And um, Julie, how often would your daughter masturbate? Daily. Constantly. Do you have animals, Beth? Okay. I was going to say, it's it's heartbreaking hearing that this come from a kid, but it makes me think of another documentary on HBO Max called um, Diagnosed Bipolar, Five Families. And it's different kids in, like, five different families who are dealing with kids with bipolar. And it kind of ties in with this, because at that time, they don't diagnose bipolar and young kids uh, when they should because then they could receive proper treatment. Obviously, this shouldn't be the go-to to diagnose kids with anything like that. So, there's a fine line between diagnosing to help and diagnosing that hurts them. So, I understand why we don't, but it's just hard seeing a kid struggle because of things they've been through, especially Beth in this situation. I mean... She has memories of these things her dad did to her. She, I mean, at one years old, had to pretty much fend for herself. And was highly sexualized before she could put sex into context. So anyway, let's get back. Wow. Can you tell me their names? Clay, Shooky, Darcy, and Annie. And Daddy said, um, a day ago, that, um, there was a stray cat who did not have a home, so Daddy is, was taking care of it and took it to the vet when he could start, when he had his flight to go. And what do you do to the animals, Beth? Stick them with pants. Do you stick them a little bit or a lot? A lot. What are you trying to do to the animals, Beth? Kill them. What do they do when you stick them with the pins? Well, Annie cries. She's a dog. She got baby birds down out of the nest, and we thought maybe she was just curious. So we explained that she could hurt them, um, put them back and went through a whole sitting down and talking to her about the problem of it. And the next day we went out to check the baby birds and they were on the ground dead with her, their necks broken. Let's talk about what happened once when you were smaller, when you, when you found some baby birds in a, in a tree. What, what did you do then? I took them out. Mm -hmm. And what did mom say to you? Um, that the mother will not come back if somebody touches her baby. Mm hmm Are the baby birds kind of small? Can you describe them for me? Well, they don't have their eyes open, but they can hear, hear me and they look up. Are they kind of helpless, little baby birds? Can they fly? No. Can they run away? Mm. Yes. They can? Are they easy to catch or hard to catch? Hard? Yeah. Well, it's hard to remember. With the baby birds, what did you do? Took them out of the tree. And what did you do with them? Right around to the also, when at the end, I picked it up, and I thought it was dead, and I came to say, Mommy, is this bird dead? And she said, um, she called Daddy and said, 
Tim and um and Betty came and um I think I remember that they said yes. Mm-hmm. And so so did the little baby birds die? I don't know. You don't remember? I just remember that I think I remember that Mommy and Daddy said the last bird we got was there. Mm -hmm. Do you know what Mom said to me? She said that all of them were dead. Did you squeeze them? Did Baby Dad squeeze them? You're doing a good job, honey. Go ahead and tell me what happened. I squeezed them. And what happened? They died. But this kind of aggression at our animals, and even uh, at our brother Jonathan, was beginning to uh, to grow to such an excess that our life was miserable at home. We had, John would cry uh, in the mornings and say his stomach hurt. We, for the longest time, we thought maybe this child has, uh, uh, has some problem with his intestinal area or maybe he has allergies. And so we tried to get all that checked out. Come to find out, Beth was coming out of her room and hitting him in the stomach. And so, as a last resort, just to protect him, we had to tie our door shut. So I guess for about the last three or four months now, we've had to tie her in at night. Sort of barricade her. The repercussions of Beth's tragic childhood led to uncontrollable rage. Despite the love and nurturing of her adoptive parents, she took this rage out on herself, on her brother, and on them. Her acts of violence became more and more cruel and frightening. Well, I noticed several, uh, like paring knives in the kitchen, missing. And my first thought was Beth. And I felt a little guilty about it at first. I thought, no. Nah. But um, I, I really didn't even mention it to her. They'd been gone several weeks. She was sitting at the table drawing and mentioned to me, what do those knives look like that are gone, Mom? And I said, what knives, Beth? And um, she said, weren't they kind of silver and about this big? And um, I knew then, and then this little smile that's not, not a sweet smile, but a malicious type of smile. And I knew then, I thought, she's got them. Tell me about the knives, where did you get them? From the drawer. And where else? Do you remember? Mm -hmm. Tell me about it. I got them from the dishwasher. What kind of knives? Um. Big sharp ones. And what do you want to do with those knives? Kill John and Mommy with them and Daddy. And when Mommy asks you about where the knives are, what do you say? I don't know where they are. What did you think she might do with the knives? My first thought was Jonathan. And the reason we thought that was that she had, by this time, she had tried to kill John on several occasions and, and openly admitted that. In the basement, she was hitting his head against a cement floor. I heard his screams and ran down and had to literally pull her hands off and she looked wild eyed. Did you get real mad at him? Did, did you hit his head real hard? Tell me about it. What did, how many times did you do it? A lot? Hmm. What was the floor like? Same up. And what happened to your brother? Tell me about it. His head hurt real bad. But his chin, he had to have stitches in it. Could you stop? You should wear his back. No. Okay. What was your brother doing when you were doing this? Playing with the, with the toys. Okay. Was he asking you to stop when you when you were doing it? 
Mm-hmm. What was he saying? He said, Dad, stop. And what did you do? I didn't stop. I just kept on hurting it. What were you thinking when you were doing that? Thinking of killing him. How did you stop? What made you stop? When I heard Peter walking across the kitchen. Mm-hmm. And then he stopped because I thought Mommy and Daddy would come. Okay. Did Mommy come? What did she do? She sent me to my room. Okay. Um... And what if Mom didn't stop you? What would you have done? Keep on doing it. And what about... What about After evaluating the extent of Beth's psychological problems, Dr. McGid felt that for the well-being of the family, Beth needed to be temporarily separated from them. In April of 1989, her parents brought her to a special home with an expert at raising children with early attachment disorders, especially children who are dangerous to themselves and others. I have children that have killed numerous times. Cold-blooded family members, neighbor children, kill them. And they can do it. Makes my blood run cold to think about nine years old. People don't think a nine-year-old is capable of cold-blooded murder, but they are. The attachment break does severe damage to the heart, the ability to care and the ability to love. If they don't care and they don't love, they're capable of anything. We're very strict, very strict about everything. Everything is completely monitored. We take complete control because a child who's unattached does not trust. And because they don't trust, they don't allow anybody to be boss of them. So we take complete control. They are not boss of anything. They have to ask to get a drink of water. They have to ask to go to the bathroom. They have to ask to leave our site. Part of that is because we cannot trust them because of the damage that they've done before. Uh, would you like to say grace, please? Jeremy, Father, thank you for this good day. And everybody don't need Jesus' name, amen. Amen. They believe that they're evil, they believe they're from the devil, they believe that they are not a person of value, and we have to change that, and we have to build that from a child who's nothing, who's, who's a bad kid in their own mind, to a child who's valuable and loving, and they see themselves as that. You don't have to have when they do a chore well, we can say, you did a good job, you're a good worker. And then it just builds that self-esteem little by little so that they change the way that they see themselves. Several months into treatment in this controlled environment, Beth had made progress, and her therapist decided to loosen some of the controls. Beth continued to show signs of improvement. She began to develop a sense of right and wrong. She seemed to respond to affection. It was more often. She went to public school, made friends at the local church, and even sang in the choir. And you go into Sunday school this morning? Yeah. And get stickers. Maybe you could put one on your nose.
In the beginning, we couldn't trust her with anything. She was locked up at night. We had alarms on the door at night, so she wasn't sneaking around doing things with the other children. We don't worry about that anymore. There's no alarm on her door at night now. She sleeps in the same room with my own daughter, and I trust her that much. She brushes the dogs, and I trust her that much. Because she has earned that trust, she's learned it, she's, she has a heart, and she has a love inside, and she feels bad when she does something now. In the past, because she didn't have a conscience, she didn't feel anything when she did something bad. There was just no feeling there. And now she does feel bad, and it shows in her face. I believe that Beth can make it. She's got a really bright mind. She's got a good heart now, which has done a lot of healing. She's got a really super set of parents. They're powerful, they're knowledgeable, they're motivated. Um, she's done a lot of good work with you in therapy, with Canal and with myself. She wants to heal, and that's the number one key. And she wants to heal because she has a family that really cares about her, and she wants to be with them. Do you know where that anger came from? That's when my birth son um, hurt me. I, I had it all inside and I remembered it. And I started doing it. And what did, what did that do when it was inside? It made me want to hurt people really bad. And who did you hurt? My brother, my mom and dad, and the animals. And the animals. Who did it hurt the most? My brother. Who did it hurt the most? Me. Why don't you tell me that? It hurt, it hurt me the most. How did it hurt you the most? Because when I hurt other people, um, I'm burning my, um, dead self. How do you feel right now, Beth? It's kind of tough to talk about, isn't it? Yes. Beth gave her last interview for this film in December of 1989. Although she had made progress, she would still need extensive therapy. Not all abused children are as deeply scarred as Beth, but all abused children suffer a profound hurt for the rest of their lives. The road to recovery is long and hard for the abused child. There are more than one million new victims of child abuse in America every year.